So hello everyone. Um, my name is Gilel Treiber, and I'm um, a postdoctoral uh, affiliated with the uh, Research Center in uh, Political Philosophy and Ethics uh, at the um, KU Leuven in in Belgium. Hi everybody. I'm Michael Gallagher. I'm a reader in education at Manchester Metropolitan University. Right. So. Gillel and I are just going to have a conversation that's uh, sort of relating to the, the the video presentation that he's done around the sort of um, philosophical and political theoretical concepts around um, the idea of power. Um, and the aim of this conversation will be to think about those concepts a bit more in relation to childhood and the kind of concerns of childhood studies. And so I suppose coming at that, I'm a bit more of a childhood studies person. I mean, I'm interdisciplinary, really. A part of my background is human geography, part of it's childhood studies, part of it's sort of sound studies and stuff to do with music. So I don't sit easily anywhere these days, but I'm, I definitely have this element of my work that's been about kind of childhood sociology, if you like, and children's geographies and stuff. So trying to think about those kind of big theoretical concepts, you know, from uh, Althusser and Gramsci and um, Nietzsche and Hobbes and so on uh, and Foucault as well which I think is, is a kind of point of common interest between myself and Gilel um, and think about how they might land when you're actually sort of thinking about children and childhood in a sort of more perhaps grounded everyday type of a sense. So the things that I'd thought that we could talk about and we don't have to stick to this uh, rigidly but I thought it would be interesting to have a bit of a discussion around children's agency and children's rights and how that connects up with ideas around power. And that maybe from that we could explore issues to do with participation and protection. Those two being sort of two ways in which you could see questions of power and agency landing in a practical sense with children's experience so so there's a you know a big kind of movement towards children's participation and involving children express them expressing their views and having the right to do that and and creating political processes to to kind of under the umbrella of empowerment and so on and then but then the protection agenda is more about sort of seeing children as vulnerable and powerless and and putting putting in place broader structures of power that kind of um take account of that vulnerability and then i thought that we could thirdly um talk a bit more about foucault and where his ideas might fit in within childhood studies and how they might apply to that thinking about agency uh, and thinking about children and childhood and i think that we both agree on the um, ethical ambiguity of children's agency and basically of agency to core uh, that 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 to try to understand theoretically what agency is doesn't entail immediately support for agency in this or that context because it is actually the context itself that is, that, that decides what this agency is capable or incapable incap of doing and hence if agency and 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 here I'm com completely in your in, in, in the first um, theme that you, you've suggested, if agency is what we define rights in relation to, so if agency and rights are immediately related to one another, if the rights that we define are rights meant to defend agency or to protect agency, then, then we're falling immediately into a sort of conceptual trap because the question we should be asking is what kind of agency are these rights? being used to defend or protect. And I think your work is, is precisely on, on these same matters as well. And, 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 and I think that this is indeed where issues of power and where the concepts of a different, the family of concepts of power uh, uh, and specifically the Foucauldian, let's say, concept of power are very helpful to, to make sense of all this. Yeah, I would, I would agree. And I, I... I don't think Foucault is unproblematic at all. That's my view. But in relation specifically to agency, I think there is a strong argument to be made that he has something useful to, his thought has something useful to contribute there. And it's particularly for me, you know, to sort of understand the context. Um, 
after that. So we're talking about 20 years ago. And at that time, childhood studies um, was very, at least in the UK anyway, was dominated by this sort of new social studies of childhood approach. So it's people like um, uh, Alison uh, James and Chris Jenks and Alan Prout and a, a sort of and then a wider group of people who were thinking about children's rights and children's agency and the very sort of um, in very simplistic terms what was being argued within that body of, of work was that children have historically been seen as lacking in agency or as incapable and not having capacity um, and that they that that that's um that's a kind of politically and ethically problematic view and that we would do better to view children as though they had agency and that and that fed into things like um you know priscilla alderson and Ginny morrow were writing a lot about children's consent to do research for example uh, or consent to medical treatment and they were making the argument that children in general have more capacity to consent than is typically believed so that it would be better to assume that children do have the capacity to consent to things rather than the kind of historical assumption that children don't that they don't have enough understanding and so on so there were a lot of arguments being made that were sort of flying the flag for this notion of children as active social agents and of seeing children as having agency and this being a sort of politically emancipatory thing so exactly as you said Gil, there was this kind of intrinsically sort of normative idea around agency that it was a good thing basically it was a good thing and children actually do have it and we should give them even more of it and we should recognize it more and then at the same time I was reading Foucault and that sort of notion just doesn't really fly within a Foucauldian framework it, it, it just doesn't work um, you can't just sort of attribute this kind of unexplained uh, inexplicable force for good just flowing through people and all you need to do is kind of put the right structures in place and everything will get better um you know for Foucault the there's this notion of his kind of notion of subjectivity if you like is that the, the subject only emerges out of relation these kind of external relations of power and institutional structure structures and so we're only able to exercise agency in so far as we've been kind of formed as subjects who perceive themselves as agents and as having the capability to to act and to to act decisively and if you you know i was doing field work in schools and you know lots of people in education research have used Foucault and because there's a very kind of obvious fit when you go into a school and you see the kinds of ways that children are required to do this and do that and sort of shaped and formed you know it's almost like this big machine that just sort of hoovers in children and then kind of molds them and shapes them and turns them into these people who are supposed to be able to sit still and stay quiet and put their finger on their lip and put their hand up when they've got a question and now it, no, it doesn't work you know because there's lots of resistance and, and messiness and again that's where Foucault is interesting in, the, in terms of those ideas around resistance but yeah so I suppose it was a, for me it was this thing of going into schools and seeing what was actually happening there in a day-to-day -day basis seemed really at odds with this this notion of children as active social agents in a kind of unproblematized way somehow and um, that was coming through in the literature and I don't mean to do a disservice to the the theorists who were writing in that literature I think there was some sophistication to what they were writing but it got taken up by people in childhood studies as this sort of mantra children are active social agents um, who you know decisively um, act within their everyday lives and I think then there comes a sort of an, a very interesting problem actually which is to say well how is it that these that these humans who are who are clearly kind of subordinated in a hierarchical sense in lots of ways but nevertheless do act decisively within the context of their lives but not in a way that's kind of absolute so you know what is you know it comes down to a sort of sociological distinction between structure and agency and how those two things relate and children i think present a lot of very interesting examples of how those two things of the complexity and fluidity of the relations between structure structure and agency
um, and and you know a lot of th their children when you kind of ethnographically observe them actually present a lot of challenges to attempts to kind of theorize that and put it into boxes and say well this is how this is what children are like children are all active social agents well no in lots of cases they're not in other cases they are but they, or they might be in combination with other people or they might be in combination with certain adults but not others or they might be in combination with certain kinds of material settings or whatever certain kinds of agencies but it's a much more sort of messy and differentiated picture I want to react. I've, I've written a few things of what 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 you were were saying. So I think that the the I think that Foucault, differently from other uh, very Eurocentric thinkers, was aware that he wasn't making a universalistic claim about what other people are doing. So his histories are always stated and also anchored in a very specific context of Western, um, of, of the rise of Western modernity, which coincides also with the rise of Western capitalism and Western colon colonialism. And, and I think that what is interesting with Foucault is given the fact that the impact of Western colonialism and, uh, and, and, and capitalism have been to import, to export, sorry, the, the model of subjectivity everywhere around the world. And precisely, I think, where you see that this model doesn't work is precisely when you go and look on children in non-Western contexts. And this is where you really suddenly start to realize, and I think that I, I touched in, in my paper on, 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 on Foucault and childhood on, on the issue of, of children's soldiers, for example, on the fact that they seem to have in certain very extreme, so I use the extreme case on purpose to show that there is, as you say, a decisiveness that cannot be ignored on the one hand. So there, it seems to be that there is a very strong sense of agency in, in some occurrence. And on the other hand, we cannot simply understand it as, oh, it is their will to join a war. So it really needs to be problematized. What is actually going on here? And that a simple idea of agency, or at least a straightforward idea of agency as a, some kind of um, how do you say it, and, and a full control of one's actions and thought doesn't seem to actually uh, uh, tell, the, tell, tell, tell the right story, or at least tell an interesting story, if, if, we, if we don't want to, to commit ourselves to, to right or wrong here immediately. And so all of this, I think, is, is indeed, I think that in that sense, Foucault remains useful uh, because his work problematizes the simplicity with which these concepts are, are used. The, the, uh, uh, specifically, if you look at, at schools, well, schools were formulated as, schools are one of the examples Foucault gives of disciplinary institutions, of course. So it's the asylum, it's the school, it's prison, differently, producing subject in different ways. So they're not using exactly the same forms of power, but they are using the same, let's say, structure, general structure that is, that Foucault terms as disciplinary power. But schools are no longer, of course, merely disciplinary institutions. They're doing much more uh, or, or, or they're very different than, than their first formulation in the 19th century. I think that the reason why schools today are so interesting is because they're uh, spaces where different rationalities of power are colliding, where, where the old disciplinary uh, rationality is still present in the terms of the structure of class and classrooms and the relation, the hierarchical relation between teacher and student, etc. But at the same time, we have this, we have the biopolitical uh, understanding there, we have more productive neoliberal rationalities that are coming into place as children, as entrepreneurs, and that they need to construct their own societies and they need to, like in the content, schools are very different than what they were, of course, in, in the 19th century. But going back to, to, your, to your work and to what you said toward the end, I think that the main, well, perhaps this is where Foucault remains fully a philosopher, is that so even in your definition, in, 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 in your own work, you emphasize this idea of the decisiveness and that this has to be also taken into account very carefully or, or problematized, but you also stated it um, here again in the question, how these sub in subordinated humans in the end, how can they act decisively? 
And, and I think that for Foucault, one of the main concepts, when you read him philosophically, that you realize one of the concepts that he constantly uh, deals with is this idea of will. What is the will? What is a will? How do we will something to happen? And basically, will, will, will is one of the, I guess, main concepts of, of 19th and 20th century Indeed, as, as you quote in, in one of your papers, that um, Engold work where, where non-Western's idea of, 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 of will of, uh, come in and may actually enrich our way of working on these, on these concepts. So, I know, I know this is something that will be really obvious to you, but I'm just sort of putting this in here for, um, for people who might be watching this video and, and the kind of to even go one level back, it is very common for people to misunderstand Foucault. I think that's my experience. Um, so sort of anyone watching these videos who, um, for, to whom these ideas in any way appeal, my recommendation would be to go and read him ideally in the, his, his actual books, you know, in translation is how I've always read. I've never, I'm not able to read French, but reading secondhand use of Foucault versus going to the, the actual thing. Um, I, personally, I don't think there's any substitute for going to the actual, the actual thing. Um, so in terms of will, like there isn't really, there's no prospect in Foucault's thought for the will to be free. You know, the, the idea of the freedom of the will. Um, the, the nearest thing to freedom that he, that he kind of approaches is, as I say, towards his later work, where he's talking about how, how the self relates to the self and how the self becomes this kind of mechanism that can re regulate itself and so the self is sort of produced by the disciplinary apparatus but then has enough kind of coherent understanding of itself to start a little bit like what people in, in that sort of typical scenario of uh, artificial intelligence in a kind of sci-fi setting where you've got a, a kind of a robot or a machine that's been built that attains sentience and then can kind of um, become autonomous in, in that sense. Um, I think that's probably somewhat aligned to how Foucault understood power, that it would form subjects and then subjects might get to a point where they, where they could relate to themselves in, in a way that kind of begins to look like something that you could describe as being free or autonomous. Um, but it's pretty kind of compromised and limited. Um, um, just to add, I think, I think you, you, you touch it, you, you, you touch upon it in, in your work as well. So the, the idea here that, that I think if we go back to that, I think the, the, you're right. If we think about people who are using this video and to get into, for example, Foucault, then indeed, I think that the main point to take there is that if you said, as you said earlier, if the subject emerges out of specific relations of power, then I think that it, the, the best way to understand the will and agency and subjectivity in, in Foucauldian sense is indeed, as, as Deleuze said, it's as a folding. It is something that is, if power is exterior, if, if, if power creates subjects, then su uh, su the, the subject is, a, is an effect of a folding of power and it actually then can re-enact itself on the institution that produced, produced it. And so it actually is a sort of folding over folding. And, and indeed, I think there, there is no other way of understanding post-structural, like Foucauldian delusion agency, except within these terms, so that we are limited subjects, that this is basically perhaps pessimistic, but it is also to some extent realistic. And it actually shows what are the challenges that we need to confront in order to change the world we're living in. So, I mean, that, that again, I, I, I think, like you say, we're in agreement and it's something about power being a dangerous thing and a very unstable thing um, in Foucault that, again, I think is helpful when you, when you work with children and when you 
when you look at what's actually going on kind of empirically in a situation with children or in a community or in a school or wherever that notion of power as being kind of productive potentially very exciting but also always dangerous um, so the idea of sort of creating some sort of perfect situation where children are in a you know that like a perfect kind of participation if you like where everyone's view is heard um, and everyone gets their say and, and everyone's view is sort of taken into account um, which would be a kind of like democratic ideal of participation if you like a sort of Habermasian kind of notion that it might be difficult but we could create this ideal situation where everyone can communicate freely and openly and honestly from a Foucauldian point of view that's not that's not really like a thing that that that, that can happen it's it is as you say more pessimistic um from a Foucauldian point of view anyway that you just get these constantly shifting relations of power and there might be very exciting things that can happen um, but there's always the possibility for sort of domination and violence kind of contained in all of that um and that i think is that the, the implications of that for, for doing work with children are potentially quite massive because it means what you're doing is kind of almost like working within the local particulars of of of, of their specific circumstances and trying to figure out you know for, for a given group of children or a community or however you want to call it what are they working towards what are their goals and aims what are their internal tensions and sort of getting into the mix with that stuff rather than sort of this approach which is historically very common with children of sort of like let's take these children and help them somehow you know emancipate them give them freedom give them a voice um, but sort of the adults seeing their role as to like to empower and to give power to children again seeing Foucault like you can't just give you can't give power to people it's this relational situation um, and another thing I always found really helpful from Foucault is this idea and it, it, this relates to your video this question of who has power and Foucault is quite explicit on that 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 for him is not an interesting or relevant question to ask so you know that's a big big picture thing but thinking about when it comes down to children and power structures i think it's always helpful to be quite skeptical of that idea that if we could just find out who the one person is we need to talk to um or if we could just change that one person's mind uh you know the effects of power arise within these shifting webs of relations and so it, when you when you're working those things it's not about like right who's the manager and how can i get their ear and how can i kind of tell them what they need to do and then they'll do it and the whole thing will sort itself out it's more like saying your role is to is to get in the thick of those relations and look at them and start to try and understand how they're operating um, and perhaps try and see things about how they're operating that that the people within those structures can't see or do see but but don't write down on paper <laughs> you know maybe see maybe talk to each other about but it never it never develops into a bigger analysis and your role as an academic or a researcher can be to to piece together a slightly bigger understanding of of the thing drawing on all the individual perspectives of people and how they understand their situation and all the rest of it i think so i think you you know better than i do in terms of concrete empirical research with and uh, with children, um, all these things. So, so I, I assume that there as well, we, um, we, we, I think that there is this tension, as you say, so you, you wanted to focus on, on participation and protection. And I think that there is an inherent tension there between on the one hand, we want children to participate. And on the other hand, our conceptual, uh, not conceptual even, our values tend to, to construct children as uh, objects of protection. So we need to constantly protect them, but we want them to participate. The problem is that I tend to believe, uh, or at least this is what I argue on my, on, on, on my paper on Foucault and, and, and childhood, that these two actually are in complete tension with each other. One cannot think of children as vulnerable and innocent, and then at the same time, expect them to be 
full participant in a society that is nor innocent nor 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 innocent nor necessarily uh, makes a lot of place for vulnerability. And so, and so, given that these two are constantly in tension, then we need really to think what do we. Um, we need to, to think what do we prefer and if indeed we give power or we give voice if there is some way to understand that simplistically then the voice that we're going to give to children the voice that is going to return to us may not be a voice that we want to hear or we want to listen to and so we're opening ourselves that there is an inherent risk to that to to to, to this to display participation cannot come without a certain openness in terms of the moral values that we uphold at a given moment. We cannot expect children, once we invite them to participate, to reflect to us the values, and specifically because you mentioned it, because we are at the beginning of a process of subject formation with children, we cannot expect them to reflect to us the dominant values that we want them to uphold. And so I think that this is demands a lot. There is a, a a very high demand of openness on those researchers that engage with children in the settings of children to be to not listen or not hear only what they want to hear actually to actually listen to what may be actually what, what is what is concretely being said yeah. when you when you look at work that's done with with children um, and particularly around kind of community development type work that happens with children there is often a, a kind of normative notion of agency which is to say a notion of agency that has built into it a certain concept of what good agency would look like and some other concepts of agency that um that are viewed much more negatively and therefore not really given space um my, there's a guy called michael wyness who's written um, about this in relation to children's participation in the labour force globally um, and what he argues is that you know so much so much of the way that we understand power and agency in relation to children is is kind of shaped and really dominated by um, at least in, in academic research let's say is shaped um, by very sort of a very very narrow kind of modern western liberal de democratic um, eurocentric set of norms and so things like um we view children's participation in work as being problematic and that they should be protected from that and that isn't a valid form of participation um because they should be in school learning or whatever else um, and so there are these moves around uh, around the world to try and eradicate child labour. Um, but his argument is that when you when you when you look outside that framework um, and you you sort of um, attend to what children in, in other places are doing, um, often their participation in work is a really significant form of participation. But all of those sorts of discussions, I think, do point up the uh, just a whole set of difficulties about uh kind of making relativistic moral claims about people who are in one setting making claims and assumptions about another setting and also about the importance of of sort of paying close attention to whatever's going on in the particular context in which you're working like you know it would be as that that argument um that actually maybe children's participation in the labour force is valid. That argument, there's lots of cases where that argument wouldn't work at all. If you if you looked at a local situation, it would be the case that children's participation in the labour market was, uh, you know, causing serious harm to those children in question. You, you'd only know that by actually dealing with the specificity of the thing in question. And that is a bit, to me, again, that's a thing that Foucault um, as, as I think you've already mentioned, sort of says again and again, he, he's, you know, often in interviews, for example, he's asked these very big questions like what is power or what should we do about this? And he's sort of reticent to answer questions at that scale. His, his, his answer is always more like, well, you know, what's the analysis that you can make of that situation based on the materials available to you and work and try and work from there. And he sort of does make these rather grand 
um, pronouncements at times, but I saw, but but it, that that all, all that often feels slightly out of step with the tenor of his work as a whole. It's almost like someone's demanded that sort of a big picture answer, and he's gone, oh, "All right then, power is the conduct of conduct." But you know, in the in the specific, da, 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 you know, with all the caveats kind of thing, with Foucault, it's almost like any kind of grand pronunciation comes with a just a, a massive raft of, of, of kind of caveats that really direct your attention towards the specificities of the context. Uh, so what, what I was trying to do, and I think that this is what, what I'm trying to do in, in my own work, was to show that Foucault actually says a lot about childhood, qua childhood, and that actually at the end of the day, this is a crucial concept for him when he sets about, not in the books, but in the lectures, uh, in the later lectures, uh, when he, not, not in the later lecture in terms of his own lifetime and in the sense of publication uh, date. So the lecture that he gave in the early 70s, he sets about to, to, to argue that childhood is a crucial concept when you think about a process that we can call the psychologization of society. If we look on our society as is right now or as it was in the 70s, we have the situation where psychology is asked to give an opinion on every possible behavior of human beings. Uh, while it didn't start, like if you move a hundred years previously, psychology is mainly, is, is mainly, first of all, psychiatry and mainly in the field of legal psychiatry, so mainly on only excessive forms of behavior. And, and he shows that this generalization of psychology that happened throughout the late 19th and early 20th century happens through the concept of, of childhood. And that it is only by making the child and the healthy child the condition of possibility of an adult, of a healthy adult, that childhood became so important for us. That actually the only reason we attach so much importance to child is that we understand every child to be in potential, the, the adult that they're going to be. And hence, we want actually to influence the adult that they're going to be. So anyhow, our, our access to childhood is immediately mediated through, through such a, let's say a utilitarian or, or like we, we use children because they're so crucial for the adult that they're going to become. I think that Foucault as, uh, is useful for child, for people working on childhood, both as um, users of his concepts, but also as well in terms of what he actively says about childhood um, in the lectures, let's say between 1973 and 1975, more or less. Uh, so psychiatric power and, uh, and the lecture course that was translated as abnormal. So these two lecture course, childhood there plays a very, very important role. And also in the history of sexuality, volume one, it does uh, come back again and again uh, as an important factor. Um, yeah as a more general piece of advice is that it's always a good idea to try to find some body of thought that resonates both with you as an individual researcher, academic, activist, whatever, however you want to describe yourself, and that also somehow resonates and connects with the, the field of your interest and the topic that you're studying. Um, and, and in my case, that has often been Foucault, but for other people, it would be, it would be somebody else. Um, but I suppose, you know, I'm thinking that this is a, a series of videos all about working with theory in childhood studies. I suppose I would say you always need something. You need some body of, of, of conceptual work that will help you kind of dig deeper into things. And I would say where he, is useful specifically on questions to do with power and agency is really this idea that it isn't that, that it isn't this one thing it's all about for Foucault it's a the question of power is is really the how question um, that Gillel asks in, in, in the video Foucault's not really interested in who has power or what it is in the abstract sense he's interested in how in specific situations through what techniques is it being exercised? So you can go into a school and you can look specifically in a very micro 
way um, at how is power on a daily basis being exercised within that setting. And then you can look at the who, who is it that's using those techniques, how are those techniques being modified and applied um, and deal with the empirical specificity of that rather than coming in with this view of like, oh, it's a panopticon. Oh, look, that school's like a panopticon, right? That's, that's us finished here. That's the analysis we're going to make. It's much more about seeing, well, are there principles of that kind of panoptic power going on here? And if so, through what techniques? And maybe they're not, maybe it's other techniques that are being used here. So pay close attention to the, the, the techniques um, and, and the sort of plurality of forms of power and the plurality of forms of agency, multiplicity, um, I would say, the multiplicity of those things and the specificity. That's what I think is, is most useful.